I'd like to welcome everyone to Gardening Green Expo 2023. The Expo is sponsored by the NSRWA, the WaterSmart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. Now, before we start, I'm going to do a little um, education for those of you who haven't been on Zoom before. Down at the bottom of your screen, there should be a toolbar, and sometimes you have to hover down there to, to make it show up. There's something called the chat. And if you click on that, a window will open and I will be pasting some links in there. And if you have any questions, you can pay, paste them in there as well. And then when Kristen's done with the presentation, I'll read the questions. So now I would like to introduce Kristen Nicholson from Blue Stem Natives. Thank you so much, Laurie. Welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Slancha, if you have your, your mug next to you, it's very hot. Hmm. It's still too hot. Um, but uh, I really appreciate you taking the time on a Friday night to, to join us for this uh, little presentation. So our topic tonight is the climate conscious garden, building resilient gardens to handle climate challenges. I have quite a few little uh, caveats that I'm gonna pepper in. Um, I'm gonna be real with everyone tonight. Uh, make sure that we're all on the same page, that we know what we need to do to build the most resilient gardens that we can. Uh, a little bit about us and how we got started. Blue Stem Natives is a women-owned native plant nursery located in Norwell, Mass. We're going into our third season. We're very excited to get started. We strive to grow local ecotype plants from seed whenever possible. And we're also committed to using environmentally and ecologically friendly farming practices. Our passion is really making native plants more accessible to the everyday gardener and increasing awareness and education around the benefits of using native plants in the landscape. Uh, so what got me interested in native plants? A few years ago, I had one of those light bulb moments, uh, goosebumps down my arm type of moments. I had been a dental assistant for 18 years, uh, bored out of my mind by the end of it. So I decided to go back to school. I heard Dr. Doug Tallamy, you may have seen his um, presentation last night. I heard his book, uh, Bringing Nature Home, and that light bulb went off. I knew that this was what I was meant to do, um, and it, it checked all the boxes for me. So I became a founding board member of Wild One South Shore Mass, along with my partner, Britt, and I discovered this deep interest and realized that native plants was where it was at for me. Uh, my passion really lies in continuously learning and teaching other people what I know. So we're all aware of what climate change means and, and, and what it's been doing, but it's really gonna bring about extreme weather um, from record rain to record temperatures and drought. Um, few plants are really capable of handling extremes in both directions. So what can we do to set up our garden spaces for success, no matter what comes our way? So just a few points. We want to start by putting in place good bones, and I'll go over what I mean by that. Um, we're going to cover all the contingencies that we can think of, even though Mother Nature loves to throw curveballs at us. Um, and we're going to learn how to choose plants that will hopefully withstand extremes. And I want to be clear from the outset that there seems to be this idea that just because a plant is native means that it'll be able to handle everything that happens weather-wise in an area. Um, there's also this idea that all native plants have deep roots and only native plants have deep roots. Um, and none of these things are absolute truths, um, no matter how badly we really want them to be true. So what is accurate is that if we're careful in our plant selection and placement, well-established gardens should be capable of surviving an extreme event. Um, I don't want anyone to think that their all native garden, beautiful though it may be, is capable of flourishing during a record drought or rainy season. So what should be expected 
is that those plants will survive to come back in the future. Many plants have mechanisms that allow them to survive extreme conditions, such as they may not flower as much, or they may go into dormancy sooner than expected. They may not have as lush foliage, um, or like we experienced this past fall, they may not produce as much seed as we had expected. Um, so none of these things really make for a glorious garden, but they do allow plants to survive and come back again the next year. So long before we uh, even put plants in the ground, there are things that we can do to make sure our gardens can handle the extremes. So by taking the time to examine our properties and really gain an understanding of any problems, we can help mitigate the pressures of events outside of our control, such as record rainfall, record high or low temperatures, and extended droughts. Um, and it's sometimes hard to see the garden bones through the trees, but that's precisely where we should start. If our garden starts off with issues, any extreme events are going to amplify them. So what do I mean by garden infrastructure? We always start with soil. Quality topsoil is a gardener's best friend, and it really should be your top priority. Um, we talk about hardscaping and structures. What kind of structures do you have in and around your garden? Sheds, paths, patios, raised decks, um, stone foundations, long driveways, basketball courts. <laughs> All of these things have effects on soil temperature, quality, drainage, and pollution. So we want to find and fix problems. Um, it's really time to look hard at the solar patterns throughout your yard. Ideally, you want to repeat this a few times throughout the year, but even just going out and um, taking a, a, just a measure of your yard during a, the peak growing season will give you a really good idea of what the sun is doing in your yard. And you want to take into consideration existing trees and shrubs that will grow taller and change the sun levels as they age. You also want to look for spots in your yard that typically have some issues throughout the year. Um, if you have an area that acts as a wind tunnel, um, perhaps you're on a main road and you experience degraded soil from the heat and salt. Uh, do you have a large sloped area or a low area where water tends to pool during heavy storms? All of these are problems that can be addressed. And all of these issues um, can help provide support for your plants. So healthy soil allows more water to infiltrate and retain more moisture. Um, that's from the Soil Health Institute. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful resource for people to check out. Um, there's a ton of really uh, geeky information on that page. Um, organic matter in soil has two important functions for drought resilience. It can store up to 10 times its weight in water, and it is used as a source of food for uh, soil microorganisms like bacteria and fungi um, and other soil life. And by uh, organic matter, we're talking about um, leaf litter and basically large particles that haven't fully broken down or in the process of being broken down. Um, and that's what really helps build good soil structure. It also helps to create habitat for um, uh, animals like earthworms. And that makes, they as they go through the soil, they make larger soil pores for water to drain through um, so that it doesn't pond up on the surface and run off, which creates erosion. And it also serves to harm aquatic life. We want you to use what's already on your property. Leaves and organic matter um, are the very best tools you have when it comes to rejuvenating soil. It never made sense to me that we spend all this time raking up and blowing and mowing all these leaves, bagging them up, leaving them on the side of the road, only to have to go in the spring to the store and pay money to buy more topsoil when we already have what we need to build really excellent topsoil. Um, so leave it, leave the leaves on your property. Uh, we also want you to try to avoid using impervious surfaces whenever possible. This contributes to runoff and compaction. 
And we definitely want to avoid using so-called weed prevention fabric, uh, which is really just plastic sheeting. And it does very little to prevent weeds because they'll just grow on top and make a giant mess. Uh, what it really does very well is prevent proper gas and nutrients exchange, which is imperative to healthy soil and healthy plants. Soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Um, I thought this infographic was really stunning. Um, it's dedicated for like, it's meant for cropland, but the same principles hold in our own yards that for every 1% increase in organic matter, US cropland could store that amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls in 150 days. That's incredible, just from fixing the soil that we're using to grow in. Um, so healthy soil helps to regulate water because it acts like a sponge. It soaks up water and holds it in place, keeps it available for thirsty plant roots. It also helps prevent runoff and erosion. When soil is poor, it becomes hydrophobic, which means it repels water and causes water to run off of it very quickly. You'll notice this when you're using potting soil um, that hasn't been moistened yet, and you can just pour as much water on top of it as you want, and it just kind of sits there and pools off. Um, dry, dusty soil is very easily washed away. It destroys that valuable top layer that provides a lot of nutrients for plants. Water obviously helps to sustain plant and animal life in soil. Uh, it also helps, um, this is healthy soil, it helps to filter pollutants from entering our waterways. And it helps doing that uh, nutrient cycling that is so important. Carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, they're all vital nutrients that are needed for abundant plant growth. And this healthy soil is facilitating that gas exchange and it makes these nutrients bioavailable, which is a fancy way of saying that it makes them usable for plants. Healthy soil also provides physical stability and support, not only for plant roots, but for human structures as well. So there's a few main principles for managing soil health um, and that we'll just touch upon them really quickly. Um, you wanna maximize presence of living roots, employ no-till procedures, um, use sheet mulching, lasagna gardening, Tilling disrupts the delicate ecosystem that lives underground and leads to even more compaction than was there before. So we want you to use living plants as mulch um, as much as possible in place of wood, plastic, or stone. It introduces more plant roots in the soil, um, which reduces weed competition, and it also helps to keep the soil cooler. Maximizing soil cover doesn't mean loading wood chip mulch right up to the stems of plants, but rather making sure that the soil is shielded from the sun um, as much as possible. And if you push your whatever mulch you're using right up against uh, plants, it can cause all kinds of problems such as rot, fungal, bacterial infections, and it also removes valuable habitat space for beneficial native insects. So you really wanna kind of move that, whatever mulch you're using away from the stems of plants. We also wanna maximize biodiversity. Uh, not much more needs to be said about diversifying the species of plants used in a garden. We wanna use native plants whenever possible and instill habits that will support a variety of wildlife in your yard. So moving on to the next part of our infrastructure, we're gonna look for um, sun exposure. Sun exposure is one of the most important questions you can answer about your garden. When you come to the nursery um, and you ask me, well, I don't have this area of my yard that I wanna look for plants for, my first question is going to be, what kind of sun do you have in that area? Um, it's gonna help guide your choices in plant material. It's gonna determine if adding trees and shrubs can help mitigate some issues. And it's gonna help save you quite a bit of money and time um, putting right plants in. There are apps 
and different appliances that can help you measure your sun exposure. But honestly, the best option is free. You're just using your own eyes. Choose the spot in your garden that you want to focus on and observe the sun throughout the day over like a good month um, is the best. The whole season's even better if you can be patient enough, which I am not. Taking pictures from early morning, midday, and dusk can help you truly understand how much sun a particular area receives, including shadows. That's very important. Um, this process can also be captured using a camera set to take photos throughout the day. So you want to aim to repeat this process throughout the growing season so you can see the changes. You can also purchase devices designed to monitor sun exposure. They range from like $10 to hundreds of dollars, which are completely unnecessary unless you're a professional. Uh, there are also apps created to do the same. Sunseeker is available for Android and iPhone. I haven't used that one personally. Um, I'm sure there's others as well. You can also use suncalc.org. I have that written on the, the slide there. This measures the sun's path across your property at various times during the year. And that's really helpful when you're planning large projects, such as installing a veggie garden, a pond, or hardscaping. Um, it takes a little, it's a little bit of a learning curve to understand how it all works, but once you get it, it's very, very helpful. And when it comes to wind, the easiest way to find out um, if you have issues is really to walk your property during windy days if it's safe. Um, of course. So walk all around your house and your yard and see if there are spots where the wind tends to be heaviest and where it's blocked. You can sometimes tell if wind is a constant issue by the manner in which um, existing plants are growing. If they're all bent one way and perhaps they have sparser leaves on one side, that's a clue that you have a persistent wind issue uh, and you want to note down the area and the direction. This was a really great example I found online of someone charting the sun in their yard. It looks like they get full sun in that back corner from noon till 9 p.m., which is pretty amazing. I don't know where, where they live, but a 9 p.m. sunset is impressive. Um, but this just goes to show that you can have all different kinds of um, sun availability in different areas of your yard. And by being able to have, reference a map like this, you can really tell which plants will work best in which areas. As another part of our quest to improve our soil quality, it's really important to reduce inputs as much as possible. This includes reducing or ideally eliminating herbicide and pesticide usage throughout the yard, including what's sprayed on plants and trees. Uh, many pesticides intended to reduce one species, such as mosquitoes, is sprayed in areas where we wouldn't think they would affect soil, but when those leaves and plant matter fall and decay, the residuals become a part of the soil and eventually destroy valuable microbes that contribute to soil health, uh, to say nothing of the damage to our native pollinators. Um, as far as watering goes, new plantings need water, no matter if they're native, drought tolerant or not. Um, you can't put plant babies into the ground and then leave them and um, expect them to all survive because it's unlikely that they will. Planting in the fall or the early spring, not quite yet, gotta be patient, but almost there, um, is really the best way to give new plantings a fighting chance. You can plant during the summer. It's not ideal, but just be aware that if you plant later in the spring or, or during the summer, you're really gonna have to stay on top of watering those new plants. Once they're established, you shouldn't have to worry about it too much, but we'll get to that too. Uh, we also wanna try to reduce mowing and blowing on our property as much as possible. One, it's gonna save us a heck of a lot of work, uh, but it's also gonna reduce pollution reduces soil compaction, and helps protect the vulnerable insects populations um, that use leaf and plant litter as habitat. 
We want to be water wise, understanding that clean water in and of itself is no longer a guarantee in so many parts of this world. We're really privileged in this area to have an abundance of clean drinking water. But as these past few years can attest, that privilege is definitely not guaranteed. So by instilling water wise habits, we can con help conserve water while also safely ensuring our gardens remain lush. Installing water barrels, rain barrels, um, is cheap and highly effective. During times of extreme drought, like we had this past summer, we can buckle down and use water in other ways from saving water from our shower warm up or collecting water from our dehumidifiers and air conditioners to use in the gardens. If we really want to dig in, you can install gray water systems, uh, which it's legal in Massachusetts, but it has certain code requirements that you'll have to look into. So you might be wondering how effective rain barrels can be if we're experiencing uh, a drought. And it's surprising how much water runs off our structures, even during very short summer rains. A single thousand square foot roof collects approximately 560 gallons of water per inch of rainfall. Um, so you could easily fill multiple barrels in a single afternoon storm go crazy and add rain barrels to every roof line uh, from the shed to the garage to the greenhouse and you'll have more access to water during the heat of the summer. And we've also um, heard a few times that we need to be able to control the water that enters our soil and mulch is one way to do that. So what is mulch? It's a permeable cover um, which allows water to drain through it freely and it helps retain moisture, keeps soil cool, and prevents weed seeds from getting enough sun to germinate. Ideally, we want to use living plants to serve as mulch. It's called green mulch. By using ground covers and planting closely, living plants can do all of these things and much more. Um, remember when I mentioned that one of the key aspects of healthy soil is extensive plant roots. Living mulch does just that. So when you can't or choose not to use green mulch, there's still a lot of better alternatives to the traditional wood chip mulch. Pine straw or salt marsh hay works incredibly well, and it's found in local shops, especially um, a lot of small businesses. So if you're having trouble locating it, call your local feed store and tell them what you're looking for. So if they know people will buy it, they will source it for you. Another great option is using a rich compost. Many people make their own, uh, but you can also buy it from reputable companies such as Black Earth Compost or Coast of Maine. And you'll use the compost just like you would wood chips, but make sure you pull it away from the base of the plants, just like that um, picture in the lower left corner. You don't want to put that compost right up against the base of any of the plants. Installing rain gardens are an excellent way to increase native plants in your landscape while filtering the water coming off of your roof. Perfect rain garden plants include those that can really handle occasional deluges and sitting in water for a little bit of time but they can also handle short dry periods. Um, there is a link in the supplement to a really fantastic plan um, by the Massachusetts Department of Coastal Zone Management. Um, and if you think you might wanna install a rain garden, I highly recommend checking that document out. It isn't just a matter of picking plants and putting them together in an area. There is a bit of a science to do it um, in order to do it properly. So make sure you follow the uh, very well written out instructions. So the, we want to talk about the difference between drought tolerant and drought resistant. Drought tolerant and drought resistant are often used interchangeably but they are really two different terms. Drought tolerant refers to plants that um, once they're well established can handle a variety of conditions and they can usually stay alive through a mild to moderate drought. 
They often have adaptations that give them a leg up when it comes to excessive heat and drought. They may have a thick waxy cuticle or leaves that fold up like this partridge pea. Drought resistant um, refers to plants that can handle long periods of time without water. These plants are typically found in desert locations and include cacti and other succulents. And herbaceous plants um, are usually quite sparse and tend to be woody and straggly in appearance. This is our native cactus. If you weren't aware that we have a native cactus, we do. It is a Pontia humifosa. Um, it is a true cactus, Eastern prickly pear. It has a beautiful flower you can see, and it does very well in terribly, terribly dry, sandy locations. And it, and it makes it through the whole winter. It looks awful in the winter, but um, come like late spring, it starts to plump back up again and it looks very nice. So why does knowing these differences matter? Uh, and it comes down to right plant, right place. If you try to plant drought resistant plants in an area, many of them won't be able to handle our winters uh, and they'll certainly um, won't thrive during a wet summer like we had two years ago. They're not built for it. Um, so drought tolerant plants tend to be pretty hardy, but you still need to pay attention to which plants you're using. Adding a non-native species because it grows well here uh, can cause all manner of problems down the road. So how do we choose the right plants? You wanna use native plants that are well suited for your sun and soil needs. I mentioned that those were very important and you wanna take into account future growth. Native plants <clears throat> are those which have grown in a region for thousands of years alongside the wildlife indigenous to an area. And they are especially capable of handling the temperatures, soil types, and typical weather of an area. We talk about something called ecoregions when we're growing native plants rather than growing zones that we might be more familiar with. So one of the things that defines native plants is where they grow. Uh, we have grown accustomed to following growing zones, uh, the USDA growing zones, um, but really when it comes to natives, it's more important to understand what ecoregion you reside in. For example, in New England, we have Northeastern Highlands, uh, Northeastern Coastal, Acadian Plains and Hills. Um, most of us are in the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens and the Eastern Great Lakes Lowlands. And if you really want to dig in, you can go all the way down to ecoregions of Massachusetts, which takes into account microclimates of different areas. So what is native to Natick isn't necessarily Natick to Nantucket. So why do we focus on ecoregions instead of the more familiar grow zones? Growing zones refers to the temperature changes in an area. So what can grow here rather than what should grow here. Zone six, which is that dark green color, uh, can encompass areas like parts of Massachusetts all the way across the Great Plains and up into Washington state. However, the plants that are native in Washington are not native in Massachusetts. And they support different species of wildlife completely. And planting outside of the ecoregion can have very serious repercussions on vulnerable wildlife populations. So there are many resources available to help you choose plants. Obviously, bluestemnatives.com. We've worked very hard on our filters um, to be able to um, let you choose the types of plants that work best for your area. Uh, we also love Native Plant Trust has a plant finder. I added that link to your uh, resource page as well. Um, and that allows you to filter by ecoregions and growing conditions. Um, this is a very important topic because everybody wants to know how to do their design. Native plant gardens have a terrible um, habit of uh, people think they just look weedy and that's not true at all. It's all in how you put 
plants together. And we have to also change how we think of things. Um, so how do we want to style these drought tolerant plants? First, we'd love for you to aim to reduce your expanses of lawn. Um, start from the corners that you don't you typically use and work your way in and reduce that lawn. Use lawn as pathways between garden spaces rather than um, large open areas. Again, use living plants as mulch. Uh, native plants really don't fare well when they are put in little clumps with big spaces between them. They tend to fall over. So you want to plant them densely. Let them touch each other. Uh, native plants love to compete with each other. Um, the strongest and the hardiest will survive, and they'll just look so much better when you do. Use other plants to provide stability for the taller species, and you'll have less of that flopping over. You really want to use grasses and sedges for visual interest, as well as providing ground cover during periods of the year when uh, different perennials are going dormant. They provide visual interest as well as keeping the ground cool, and um, they help provide an incredible habitat for um, um, various wildlife. Many of our native sedges are actually incredibly important for uh, caterpillars, like Pennsylvania sedge supports over 35 different species of caterpillars. Um, you also want to plant species in groups or massing in order to provide the biggest punch. That's really, um, you can see that in the left picture there. It looks better. It looks more intentional. It provides better support for pollinators, and it also allows you to group plants together with similar water needs. Uh, plants that have certain characteristics tend to be more drought tolerant, including those with silvery or gray leaves, or those that fold up in times of stress, um, or ones that have very dense mesh-like mesh root systems. So if you do have some favorites that require more water, but you just can't bear to leave them out of your garden, consider using large containers that you can focus water usage in. So including some of those new um, smart pots or self-watering system planters, and you can put those right into your garden amongst your other plants. So what do we do if we do experience an extreme drought and we have all these lovely plants? How do we take care of them? First, you wanna water deeply and infrequently, which is kind of completely opposite of what we really wanna do. This includes what lawn you do have. Frequent watering encourages shallow root growth, and it increases the chance that plants won't survive a prolonged heat wave. You want to apply water directly to the soil, avoiding overhead watering. Drip irrigation is really your best option, and you can even set up a drip system from your rain barrels. Don't fertilize before or during an expected heat wave. Fertilizing encourages plants to put more energy into growing larger leaves and flowers, and that can add to their stress during drought conditions. So if you don't use a living mulch, adding a very lightweight mulch is the next best option. Rich loamy compost works really well. Make sure you leave that space uh, between that foliage drip line. I'm going to hammer that point home because... We always love to put mulch right up against the plants. Um, leaves are also a perfect mulch, but it's probably the wrong time of year. So getting that salt marsh hay or garden straw is an excellent choice. And that's gonna help keep the ground cool. It's gonna help slow evaporation and it won't soak up water like a dry wood chip mulch does. If we have a very extreme event, you can also add temporary shade in very sunny areas. Something as simple as an overturned tomato cage wrapped in burlap can help create enough shade to get your plants through the worst of things. Um, and it needs to be said that protecting your plants from foraging is one thing, but animals still need sustenance. And a lot of times when we're experiencing an extreme drought, um, our plants get eaten down to the ground because that's how many um, creatures get enough water to survive. Um, so really put out water barrels for wildlife, including shallow dishes for insects. 
um, you want to make sure that you put some rocks and marbles or whatnot um, so that bees and insects don't drown in it. You can also add BT dunks to water barrels to prevent mosquito infestations. They will not harm animals uh, drinking from those sources. They're perfectly safe. So now is the part where everybody's looking forward to um, some very specific plants that we really find um, amazing for drought um, tolerant gardens. These are just a tiny little sample of some of our favorite plants. Uh, Camicrista fasciculata, which is the partridge pea, uh, really prefers full sun, dry to moist soil, like it can grow anywhere. Uh, it can handle just about everything. It's a great annual to sprinkle throughout the garden for ground cover and to reduce, uh, to rejuvenate soil. It is a legume, so it fixes nitrogen, um, just like any of the other pea family plants that we're used to. Uh, Sertium discolor, which is the field thistle. That one likes full sun and dry soil. This is an amazing pollinator plant um, and birds love the seeds. So you definitely wanna have some thistle in your yard. Aerogrostis spectabilis, which is purple love grass, one of my very favorite love um, favorite grasses. It's perfect. Um, it's a mounding grass. Uh, use it as a ground cover. Its gorgeous color throughout the year changes different colors. Supports butterflies and the birds eat the seeds. Love that one. And of course, um, our favorite Schizocarium scoparium, which is little blue stem. We loved it enough to name our business after it. Um, so it's obviously a favorite of ours. You can use this one to, throughout the garden to provide visual interest. It gets around three feet tall. Um, obviously it is a grass, it is wind blown, pollinated. So it's, uh, the seed, seeds will blow in the wind and pop up here, there and everywhere. It provides shade for smaller plants, support for taller plants, and it has an extensive root system. It's a wonderful, wonderful plant. Baptisia tinctoria, is very hardy, prefers dry soil, and has very petite yellow flowers. Um, it is the host plant for, is it the dusky, dusky indigo? I forget all of a sudden. Um, for It is a host plant for a um, at-risk um, butterfly species in Massachusetts. I think it's the dusky wing something. Um, and finally, Astrologus canadense, which is Canadian milk vetch. This one pref prefers very dry, sandy soils, um, and it can handle deer pressure. And it also works to fix nitrogen to improve the soil. So it's just a few selection. Um, and these conditions, the sunny and, and dry soil just happen to match up perfectly with our aptly named Hellstrip Garden Kit, um, which is a mixture of 12 plants, especially chosen for their ability to handle full sun, dry soils, and a little bit of salt tolerance to throw into the mix. Um, so these just give you a few more ideas of other plants that would work for you. And we have other kits available just like this um, for pre-order through our website. Advance, there we go. Now, this is the most challenging um, of circumstances, dry and shade brutal to try to find plants for, but we do have a nice healthy mix of plants that work well in this area. Um, so for shady and dry areas, we have the Christmas fern, um, which is a very short statured fern that holds its foliage well into the early winter, which is why it gets its common name of Christmas fern. Um, so most ferns prefer more moisture, moisture soil but the Christmas fern can really handle some dryness. Carex pensylvanica um, is an amazing sedge I had mentioned. It is perfect for shady areas, grass-like foliage. It only grows like eight to 10 inches, supports over 35 species of caterpillars. Um, if you have a shady septic field um, where nothing grows like I do, this is perfect because it actually has a shallow root system of only around six to eight inches. Um, so in that aspect, it's quite good. 
Fragaria virginiana is practically bomb proof, uh, wild strawberry. It's a ground cover, will fill in large areas very quickly while still allowing other plants to grow. And this one is also able to easily grow in a container. Asters, we have like a million different asters, um, all different heights, colors, um, and they bloom later in the summer into the fall. Um, which is wonderful. This Eurebia macrophylla, big leafed aster, um, big leaf doesn't even cut it because I've seen some of the leaves like the size of my face. <laughs> no, it's, it's almost like a hosta replacement. Very nice. Solid Dago casea um, is wreath or bluestem goldenrod. It's adorable, so cute. It's very small stature, so it's not one of those six foot tall goldenrods that we, we usually see perfect for wooded edges. Uh, it provides late season color and valuable nourishment for uh, native bees. And finally, we have Penstemon hirsutus, which is a smaller and more colorful option than its cousin Penstemon digitalis, which likes sun. Um, and this one prefers part sun to shade, um, and bumblebees and hummingbirds love the tubular flowers. Since most people ask about our recommendations for lawn replacements and ground covers, these are a few of our favorites. I've already mentioned a couple. We do have some native violets, which I think are lovely. And I encourage the ones in my yard whenever I come across them. Antenaria uh, species, we have a few, which is um, pussy toes. So sweet. They're so cute. The leaves are fuzzy. They're so pleasant. And then they grow up, um, they throw up these little flower spikes that uh, look like little cat toes, little cat bean toes. Um, so that's how they get their common name. And those are perfect for bordering pathways. Um, again, wild strawberry, put it anywhere you want. It's my go-to for lawn replacement. And for um, part sun to shade, you gotta put in that Carex Pennsylvanica. It's really, really a great alternative. And that's it for me. I think I talked really fast tonight, but um, you can find so many of the plants that I talked about tonight on our website, bluestemnatives.com. We do open uh, May 6th, and we are going to be having lovely vendors, including Wild Ones, join us for the weekend. So I do encourage everyone to come by and see what we have available. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kristen. That was very informative. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. I'd like to encourage everybody to join us tomorrow at Kennedy's Country Gardens in Situate. We're having our first uh, live expo since 2019. We didn't have it for three years because of COVID. So this is our first one coming back. And we've got all kinds of vendors and exhibitors. And we've got a food vendor and uh, there's a tool sharpening truck. There's a lot of really cool things. So I hope you guys will join us there tomorrow. It's from 10 to two. And looks like we've got some questions popping in. Uh, let's see. How do you recommend getting rid of briars? Are any native? We do have native briars. Uh, green briar in particular is the one that is just it's very difficult to tell briars from non-native invasive plants. Um, if they're just straight green and prickly as heck, um, those are probably green briars. And as obnoxious as they are, if they're in the way, I would cut them back, but they do provide um, quite a valuable resource. So uh, typically they provide um, cover for mammals, small mammals from uh, predatory birds and such. Um, they will also help keep deer out of your yard if, if they're kind of surrounding your yard. So they have their purpose. Um, otherwise, most of the thorny things that we have in our wooded areas, I would venture to guess is probably uh, multiflora rose, which is a massive, massive invasive problem. Um, and you just got to pull, pull, cut back and pull. Okay, the next question is, what was the grass ground cover in the last screen? Yep, that was Carex Pennsylvanica, uh, Pennsylvania sedge. 
Okay. Could you give a recommendation for a shrub? I live on a pond with sand for the entire backyard and a heck of a north wind. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to plant um, right up to the pond, um, a water loving species would probably be like a button bush would be amazing. Um, those can grow literally in water, um, but they don't have to be um, in water so they can handle the drier area too. Um, and then I would think about, that's always, that would be my go-to for that one. Um, some grasses in there too. When you're dealing with wind and you want to put up a wind screen, you don't want to put up just a wall of one particular plant, whether it's shrub, trees, or anything. You want to stagger things and you want to have different species. So you could do some willows. Willows would be a perfect option for this. Do a couple of willows throughout that, add in some button bush around that, kind of stagger them around, um, add some depth because that's really going to provide the best windscreen possible for you. Okay, and it looks like we have a comment. In this area, Babtisia tinctoria is a host plant for the frosted elfin butterfly. That's the one. I could not think of what it was. I had yeah. a dusty wing in my head, and that yeah. was it. <laughs> All right, I think that is all the questions and comments. Thank you, Kristen, for your... Oh, nope, we have another one popping up. I have heard that wood ash will kill off knotweed. Is this a safe method or will it impact the ecosystem in a negative way? I have not heard that yet. Um, the best way I have heard that um, to manage knotweed is to um, do a periodic cutting of it uh, over the season. So you're cutting, you know, two to three times a season, letting it grow a little bit, cut it down, let it grow, let it cut it down. Um, and then let it grow till the fall when it starts to flower and apply an herbicide. That seems to be the most effective way, um, but it's still going to be a multi-year process. Brutal plant. All right. Another question just popped in. What kind of plants would be happy near a downspout? Yeah, any of those plants for like a rain garden type of um, area would be awesome. Um, plants that can handle dry, but also like occasional deluges because there's a lot of water that comes down downspouts. Um, again, button bush, that's a great shrub if you want to have like a foundation shrub near you or some of the dogwoods if you have a little bit of more shade. Um, would be great. Um, there's anything that if you look in the filters on our website, especially, and it mentions that it can handle um, average to moist soils, those are ones that I might look at for plants near a downspout. I think that's the end of the questions. Everyone's just saying thank you for your presentation. Okay. So thank you, Kristen, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out tonight to listen to our talk, and I hope we see you tomorrow at Kennedy's Country Gardens. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.